This review was originally recorded on May 31st, 2021, making it chronologically the ninth review just before the school days one, as such all days and dates referencing seasonal anime and whatnot refer to that. A dark fairy tale of teams more relevant now than ever before. Nausicaa is a classic Studio Ghibli story set in a post-apocalyptic world that suffers from an ever-encroaching toxic disaster. Like many Ghibli films, even if it isn't actually one, it's riddled with sometimes simplistic but always wonderfully depicted teens and messages alongside a fun and endearing cast of colourful characters and places for us to temporarily inhabit. Let's walk through the spoiler-free segment first. Animation and music. This almost goes without saying when discussing works by Hayao Miyazaki, but there is almost nothing to complain about in this regard. The art style is the usual enchanting, picturesque trappings that go so far as to make every still a poster in its own right. One point of note for me was that uh, the Ohm, whom when stationary appear like moth background paintings, only for them to spring to life as their individual sections convulse, makes for an impressive sight. Then we have the character designs, from the old men of the valley who inspire images of the dwarfs from Snow White, to Teto and the emus who fill this world with a sense of more tranquil animals, which can contrast the insects of the toxic forest, which, speaking of, is filled with a variety of beasts, which do a wonderful job of being both majestic and terrifying in equal measure. The fight scenes, while not revolutionary, are highly entertaining and fluid. The OST fares in much the same light. It's, as you'd expect, packed with whimsically calm pieces for the film's quieter moments, and appropriately tenser ones for the fight scenes. Most of all, you have the large orchestral pieces that fill up most of the movies wonderful, most of the movie wonderfully. My favourite track is the one used for the more trance-like scenes. It has a child singing merrily, accompanied by wind instruments, which goes to create something eerie and yet beautiful, much like the insects themselves. I don't think I'd list this as the strongest Ghibli OST I've ever heard, but I'd be open to hearing an argument in favour of it. Story and characters. Again, when we talk Ghibli, there's an expectation for this category, and it doesn't disappoint. The film's central messages relate to violence and pollution, alongside the dangers of not living in harmony with nature. The characters can often be simple, but brilliant efforts are put into their characterization, which in turn helps them keep them helps keep them distinct and engaging. Nausicaa herself is highly spirited and an adventurous young woman, fiercely independent but also deeply caring for the people who court her princess. Contrastingly, we have Her Highness Kushina, who we immediately know is a very different sort of princess based solely on her title, Her Highness. The other characters fare similarly. Oba Abba, who sees more clearly than the others but is literally blind. Lord Yupa, who is in his world travelling, has learned wisdom in the value of when to and when not to fight. Or Mito, who acts as Nazuka's loyal attendant and proves that humans don't have to be stuck in their old ways. These characters all find their depth not in an extensive character studies or flashbacks, but instead through their fun personalities and implied histories, which in large part condones to the lived-in feeling the film's world expunges. The story itself is standard Ghibli fare. It involves a journey amongst a great many locations as our characters attempt to stop both an impending violent collision of rival factions and to learn the secrets of their collapsing world. Nausicaa is rapidly nearing its 40th birthday, and like much of Ghibli's portfolio, is a body of work that all anime and animation fans should endeavour to see someday. I myself am quite late to the Ghibli party, having not grown up with the films, but it's a pleasure to say that regardless of your age, you should find plenty to appreciate within this film. I find myself truly encaptivated by its world, but like a fleeting dream it is overall too fast, compelling me to someday read its manga and the vague popes of touching that magic once more. The film has a quality dub and is available from the likes of Netflix, so if you haven't already, do yourself a favour and make time for this classic. Now, without further ado, spoilers ahoy on being late to the Ghibli party. As mentioned, my introduction into Ghibli films has come rather late, with the only entry I had seen being my neighbour Totoro for quite some years. This wasn't so much out of a disdain, but rather due to circumstance. I simply didn't grow up with these films, and as an adult I always found myself too busy to dedicate any real time to watching many full-length anime movies. However, due to certain recent global pandemics and the sudden influx of free time, I took it upon myself to start watching more anime films, in an effort to expand my knowledge of the medium. Now, you might be wondering what this has to do with the price of potatoes, but <laughs> put bluntly, I find Ghibli films near painful to discuss. They're just too unique. Sure, I can throw around a series of vaguely eloquent words for the spoiler-free section, but getting into the details of these films makes me feel somewhat out of my depth, and then that anything I would hazard has already been said by those more knowledgeable than I. With all that said, I set myself something of a personal goal to review at least one Ghibli film 
before reaching my 10th review, and after watching Nausicaa it became abundantly clear this was the one I wanted to talk about. Therefore I've broken form a little here, and not watched or read anyone else's critiques of the film yet. As such, if I repeat anyone's thoughts, you have my utmost apologies, but rest assured the following analysis is all my own rambling thoughts on the film. Now then, before my indulgently mundane tale bores anyone to death, let's get back on topic. Something that I find fascinating about stories like this and Lapita Castle in the Sky is their accessibility to both adults and children. It's a part of what makes these stories different from the Disney tales of years gone by. Where an adult can watch those and appreciate the craftsmanship, there is a concession to be made that you are watching something aimed at children. But with a story like Nausicaa, you're presented with something kids can enjoy, but that adults can find a whole lot of level of meaning in. None of this is a slight against Disney, many of their films are quite sublime, but there's a certain something Ghibli has that its contemporaries lack. An example is called for. Take the death of Simba's father in The Lion King. It's a memorable moment that has clung to many of us as one of the darkest in the whole Disney canon, and one could say it's comparable to the death of Nausicaa's King Jiu. However, here is where the differences lie. Mufasa's death works to communicate that Scar is evil, manipulative, and out for himself, even at the sacrifice of his own family. Conversely, Jahil's death tells us the mentality of the enemy soldiers in the world of Nausicaa, how, they move, <laughs> how they're more than happy to kill an invalid if it makes the subjugation of the people slightly easier, content to storm a peaceful nation's stronghold without a second thought. Furthermore, it tells us about Nausicaa, who we see is more than capable of putting her jungle-exploring talents into the act of combat and killing. Mind you, it's unclear whether she actually killed anyone, but she certainly gave them some real concussions. We see what in a blind rage even the kindest of humans is capable of, which of course draws parallels between her and the quite own creatures, who are also peaceful, but capable of great destruction when enraged. Again, none of this suggests that Disney movies are shallow, but rather to highlight how every action in this film carries weight and purpose, and goes to further drive home the themes of the story, which is part of what makes this such essential viewing. Speaking of themes, let's touch on those a little more. Its own jungle of themes. Like I mentioned before, the themes aren't overly opaque. Like in many other Ghibli films, the messages of anti-war and pollution are fairly clear to see with little effort. However, what can be less of obvious is the amount to which everything ties back into said themes. Small details of the world building that you may not give a second thought are actually what makes these ideas so effective. A very early example comes in the form of Nausicaa's first scene. She comes across the discarded outer shell of an ohm, proclaiming the material to be highly useful. What we're seeing here tells us a lot. For one, it's an early indicator that this massive creature has a shell made of some greatly durable material that uh, Nausicaa's knife doesn't even scratch. But far more importantly is the nature of the ohm. They shed their skin, most likely as a way to rid their bodies of toxins, or so they can grow larger. But what matters is that the old shell is left behind. The insects have no issue with Nausicaa taking a part of it away with her. No, in fact, it's quite clear that if humans were willing to live in harmony with the jungle, then it in turn has no problem with providing for them too. We obviously see this more later revelations that the jungle is actually trying to purify the soil, of its poisons and clean the underground water sources. But what I appreciate is that in a simple detail like the ohm shell, we're already seeing teams on display. This goes further when than just the world building, stretching into character designs. Take a look at the adults of the valley. Most of them have six shell cartridges adjoined to their jackets. This instinctively makes us think that these are people who have cause for such equipment in their day-to-day -day lives. Yet in reality, it's deeper than that. The fact that they wear them openly openly in a place of vulnerability declares to any visitors that they have no intention of hiding their hostilities but also as a reinforcement of the kingdom's philosophy of only using small amounts of fire they aren't going around armed to the teeth but rather with just enough to keep the balance between themselves and the jungle we just see this again with their swords unlike those of the torkians who wield sharp-edged offensive blades the people of the valley carry smaller rounded daggers again showing true their character designs that their intention is balance not violence. World building is once more prevalent to the teams in its depictions of warships. At first the ships of the anime may actually come across as something of a contrivance when they each get destroyed against a single fighter plane. Despite this a line from Mito confirms that the vessels getting destroyed so rapidly is not a story contrivance but an unfortunate aspect of their design. We later see that the far better maintained valley gunship is much more sturdy than the larger warships. 
Put bluntly, what we are seeing is an army fueled by the technology of its forebears. In this, it quite heavily mirrors Laputa. We have science that seems leagues ahead of our own in this world, and yet equally, there are frontline soldiers running around in heavy-duty plate armor wielding swords. As Lord Jupa makes clear, in the thousand years since the seven days of fire, the remaining kingdoms of the world have been tearing one another apart. The first village we see Yupa walk through could possibly be one of those destroyed villages, or equally it may just be a settlement no one came to help in its time of need. And that's the point. The nature of the jungle isn't one of encroaching on the people, but vice versa. When an enraged Ohm dies, its body spreads spores, which expands the jungle. But the Ohm only become angered when force is used against them. As such, it's possible the speed at which the jungle spread would be dramatically lowered were it not for human conflict. Coming back to the warships for a moment, they are clearly the, they are clearly the last of Her Highness's vanguard. Her force is now depleted after the campaign against the Pejite peoples, and who knows how many other armies. As such, her remaining ships are not only most likely aged and relics from times gone by, but also in no state for battle. Again, we're seeing the world building creeping into every corner of the themes. It's obvious when the Torkians have relapsed back to the days of swords and shields, but in a desperate bid to hold control over the world, they continue to use outdated tanks and airships of their forefathers, much like how they intend to use the giant warrior to levy control of the remainder of civilization and burn the poison jungle to the ground rather than live with it. Very thematic characters. We're not done with teams, but let's now talk about them through the gaze of the characters. As mentioned, Nausicaa most clearly matches the Ohm. She's empathetically caring and more than willing to save strangers, but she can be determined, stubborn, and an intelligent force to be reckoned with when challenged. Up opposite to her, we have Kashushana, also a princess, but one with, who far more closely matches up with Teto, the fox squirrel. That may seem derogatory, but the initial point of Kushina's character is that while she may bear her fangs and come with a fierce bark, in truth she has little knowledge of the jungle. A self-incompetent armed force, uh, sorry, a semi-incompetent armed force, and shows cowardice when faced with the old nest. But again, like Teto, that isn't to say she is a coward. No, indeed, she leads from the front lines, and in her limbs she has lost a great deal. She's right to be wary of people. She makes her an interesting villain, which apparently the manga delves even further into. But it should suffice to say her character is one of understanding why people act with violence. Kushana isn't evil. She instead acts out of fear, in the same way that Teto bites Nausicaa when they first meet. And equally, both of them find an interest in the young princess after their initial disagreement. One of the last topics I want to touch on is the title Valleys itself. But first, let's touch on one more important character, and that's Mito. I earlier, descri I earlier described him as being Nausicaa's vassal of sorts. He appears to handle many of the valleys day-to-day -day running alongside her in the king's ill stead, and as such, one of the valley is one of the valley's primary protectors. It's in this that he most contrasts the other soldiers we meet. Take staff officer stroke commander Kurota, a shrewd and pragmatic realist of a man. He follows the orders he's given with seemingly little backbone, though he does prove some degree of loyalty and competence as an af as an officer before the film's close. He orders killing without hesitation, and thinks little of the deaths on either side. By comparison, Mitu can be an efficient warrior, effortlessly taking out the Trakian fighter plane with the valley's gunship. Furthermore, his eye patch tells us he's a man who served his time in combat situations. But what's important is he isn't set in his ways. Despite being maybe the oldest character other than Obaha, when the time comes, he doesn't shoot the lower ship that's trying to take the injured young Ohm to the valley. But instead, at the behest of Nausicaa's plea, he is able to put aside his urge to kill and instead follow her, follow her decisions. What's important here is that he can change. He isn't controlled by some innate urge for murder. And that is a hope. In a movie that is seemingly so scathing of the folly of people, war and planetary destruction, in the valley and its inhabitants we have hope. Peaceful valley. There's, as you'd expect, quite a lot that can be said about the valley. We can infer it was once a much higher population, based on things like the number of smaller airships and weapons found within the castle, and the myriad of other armour and equipment in the castle's underground sections. Due possibly to war or trying to push back the jungle, the people are now relatively few. In particular, as the children, there ain't many. In fact, in over a year of Lord Yupa's absence, only one child has been born, which is indicative of the populace's generally older age grouping. Possibly due to tradition, or maybe because of some conflict or population lowering thing, the people are a simple folk. 
they have a great deal of fate in the wind, rightfully so, considering its role in keeping the air clean. And furthermore, they place stock in the trust of superstition, looking to Hobaba as something of an oracle of wisdom, and to Lord Yupa for experience of the outside world. Aside from the implied history of the land, we're shown a beautiful town of windmills and farmland, where the people live in harmony with the land. They have a reverent, they have a reverence for the forest to one side, and rely on the runes on an aged airship by the lakeside as a last resort retreat. They are, as a people, pacifist, opting to use minimal extermination of the spores, being far happier to see the likes of Nausicaa guide an insect away rather than fight it and risk an all-out battle with the jungle. This isn't to say they're cowards. No, indeed, they're very brave and hardy people. But once more, we see that there's hope for a way of living other than violence. Even the villagers that do get violent, we see it in minimal ways. For example, three of Nausicaa's other accompanying bodyguards during the hostage portion of the story are shown assaulting a tank. At first, it seems like they're going to blow it up. But instead, they cleverly commandeer it with flash grenades and are then able to use it to temporarily turn the tide of battle in their favour. It's in little ways like this that we see the hope the writer seems to have for people finding that better way. But lightly, the valley is beautiful. It stands stark against the desert-laid barren parts of Pejite that we see, and this beauty plays back into the idea of an idyllic fairy tale, making it all the more crushing when this peaceful land is accosted, and its king slain for merely being located in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's amazing just how much I care when this happens, Anime with full-length episode runs have failed to make me care this much for a town I've spent barely an hour in, and I think that condones another large part of the magic of Ghibli films. For example, I love the Gundam series, especially Gundam 79, but I've never completed Zeta Gundam because of, well, let's just say it has issues for brevity, minus spoilers I guess, but during Zeta's run, Hong Kong comes under attack. We spend a decent portion of episodes located here, and yet the Psycho Gundam, yes, that is the name of an enemy mech, and yes, this is show is a train wreck when it wants to be. Starts tearing down entire skyscrapers, and I really couldn't care less. It's because we're shown the people of the valley, their kindness and quaint culture, and understand their purpose-filled architecture and awe-inspiring scenery, that when a Turkey and warship purposely collides through one of said inspired windmills, we really feel the tension. Despite the comic relief nature that much of the villagers play within the story, the destruction of the windmill and subsequent ransacking of the valley really hits home in an impressive way. Conclusion Five Ghibli films at the time of writing later, and I can really start to see why these films are held in such revere. They're truly amazing in all regards, and this goes further with the many works of Hayao Miyazaki, who truly puts his own feelings and efforts into these stories. I feel like I know the man through his work, directing and writing. As cliched as that might sound, and that is in large part down to the honest soul of a movie like Nausicaa, that it bears thought. It's not afraid to paint humanity in a harsh light for its sins, but it's also able to show an alternative way of life, able to have a plenty a moment of levity, to have a happy and hopeful ending, and I think that's something pretty amazing about it. I hope this fairly short review has helped to convey what is in what it is that captivates me so much when watching these movies, especially in the case of Blackwater, which I'd apply most of what I've said to here as well, and Nausicaa. I'm most definitely tardy in arriving to the Ghibli party, but I'm glad that it's a case of better late than never. Thanks go to my friend who helped me with making a list of essential films that I really should have seen, and my condolences to my brother's Netflix accounts, which I have now forever filled with weeb films. Said films seemingly can't fail to live up to my high expectations, and are truly an honour to get to experience so readily at my leisure. So if you haven't already, make sure to give this one a watch. I hope you found yourself, I hope you too find yourself enthralled by the majesty of these gripping worlds and their narratives. And lastly, I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for reading. We'll see you in the next one.